And I turn your attention this morning, beloved, to the 90th Psalm, Psalm number 90. It was like many ministers wondering, what, what do we preach this morning? What do we preach today in these times? Um, certainly many are turning their minds to the 91st Psalm, which for obvious reasons, as you will read it, you will see why. But my mind was drawn to the 90th Psalm, the very oldest of the Psalms, a Psalm penned by Moses, and has given the title, A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. And my intention is to uh, go through this Psalm with you over the course of the services that are ahead. We will pick up again this evening from where we leave off this morning, and then next Lord's Day again return, God willing, to this psalm and seek to familiarize ourselves with it, with its language, with its comforts, with its warnings, and with all that it has to uh, help us as believers during the days in which we live. We don't want to be uh, dwelling too much upon all that is going on. We have to be aware, and it is our duty certainly not to bury our heads in the sand and be ignorant of what is happening in our world. But at the same time, and I often say this to people, in times of uncertainty, the one thing we ought to do, perhaps more than anything else, is to become even more familiar with our God. And we read in the psalm already, Psalm 55, that in the morning, in the evening, and at noon, we will pray. And certainly that may be an exhortation for us to take to heart at this time, to be even more in prayer, perhaps, than normal. But here we are in Psalm 90. We'll take time to read all of the psalm, though we will be only looking at the opening few words this morning. But Psalm 90, let us hear the word of the Lord, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in Thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days when thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Lord, bless not just what we have read, but our consideration in thy word this morning. Thou knowest every heart and every need, and I pray that there would be a message, perhaps even some watching on, that are yet in a condition of unbelief, not saved, not in Christ, and filled with uncertainty in these days. God of mercy especially upon them, but upon all thy people, draw near and bless through this means, we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. As humanity faces its latest trial, I turn your attention this morning, beloved, to the oldest psalm in all of Scripture. This psalm, written by Moses, causes us to consider not just what it says, but the context in which it was written. When we think of living through difficult times, it's hard to forget the life of Moses. God didn't have him in the Egyptian court as he began his days in order to pamper him, but to preserve him and prepare him. And whatever luxuries he enjoyed in his first 40 years, they swiftly came to an end when he fled to the desert of Midian. The story, the history, is very familiar to us. And no doubt it was a great adjustment for him. His isolation from Egypt during those years in Midian, being away from the luxury that he had once enjoyed, and the presence of his Hebrew kinsmen that he was familiar with, that would not have been an easy thing for him to endure. And it didn't last just a matter of weeks or months. It was to go on for 40 years. When God finally called him to deliver the Hebrew people, again, it was not into luxury. It was not such a victory that brought him into peace and rest. Rather, it was 40 years of grueling testing, leadership of a people that so often were unwilling to heed the Word of God. So when the Spirit of God titled this psalm, A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God, the fact that he was a man of God is not reflected because he had an easy life. Sometimes people imagine that the more godly we are, the easier life may be. But that is not the case at all. In fact, the Scripture plainly warns us not to think in this way. We are told clearly that in this world we shall have tribulation. This is a world that will come against the people of God, give them hardship. Indeed, God will use the hardship of this world to prepare us and to use us. And so being a man of God, being a woman of God, does not remove us from the hardships of life. In fact, it may actually bring us into greater hardship, and we will prove the fact that we are men and women of God by our response to such difficulties. Moses was pushed to the very edge. I will not rehearse the events of his life and what he dealt with, but certainly, if you're familiar, you will know that at times this man was brought to wit's end corner and hardly knew where to turn, but turned to the Lord and found him to be all that he needed him to be in days of great testing. How he faced those trials certainly proved him to be the man of God that he is clearly depicted as being. And whatever we are facing at present, beloved, whatever way in which these matters and these events as they unfold are affecting you or will yet affect you, I trust that you will be determined to be a man of God, a woman of God, and not to lose heart, but to prove the sufficiency of the Lord's grace. That's what Moses did. He proved that God is sufficient, even in the most testing times. When you have a mass of maybe two million people and nothing to feed them, nothing for which they can turn to drink and, and all sorts of other scary and frightening circumstances that they faced in the wilderness, all sorts of uncertainties that they came through, this man proved that God is sufficient. God is able to lead His people and prepare them and help them in spite of the trials they face. And so I don't know, I really do not know what lies ahead. Perhaps all of this will blow over very quickly, and indeed there's a part of us that prays very much to that end. There is another part of us, of course, that in some way welcomes that which will humble proud hearts. And while we do not wish any form of disaster upon our land, Again, God at times certainly has used these events to humble people and to turn them to Himself. And should it be that through the fearfulness of these times, many seek the Lord, certainly that would be a reward and a blessing indeed. But regardless, since no one knows, 
even those with all of the data. We must therefore know our God and turn our hearts to Him. And so this morning as we commence a walk through this psalm, we think first of all uh, of this morning of, as we look at verse 1 really, a dwelling place for the people of God, a dwelling place for the people of God. Of God, And we will continue with this message tonight, I am thinking, uh, but I want us to see, first of all, as we ask a number of questions in relation to verse 1, which says, Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. I want us first to ask the question, how has God become our dwelling place? How has God become our dwelling place? You see it there, Thou hast been our dwelling place. The word dwelling place has the idea of a place of defense or a place of refuge, a place to which one may call home and run to for uh, refuge, as it were, from all their wandering, from all their toil, from all the danger that they face. They can return to the dwelling place and be safe. That's the sense of the word. A place to which we naturally resort when there are uncertain times a place that we love, a place where we rest securely. This is the idea of the language. And Moses says, Thou hast been our dwelling place. Thou hast been our place of safety and security, of refuge and of peace in all generations, at all times. It doesn't matter whether it be in this particular day or in previous days, God had proved Himself to be a place of rest for His people. Matthew Henry said, true believers are at home in God. True believers are at home in God. But the question I am asking here is how? How has God become our dwelling place? Are we born and this is the case? Is it so that all men that are born in this world find in God their rest and security? It certainly does not seem that way. And as we even observe the world and how it lives, it does not live in a fashion in which men are born into a condition in which God is their place of defense. Far from it. And I want to answer this question by looking at it from two perspectives. First of all, the human perspective. How has God become our dwelling place from the human perspective? In another psalm, a psalm penned by David, he recorded in Psalm 31, verse 2, Bow down thine ear to me, deliver me speedily, be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me. And David prayed to God that God would be a house of defense to save him. He was crying for help. He recognized his need for help, and it resembles really a cry for salvation, that God would save, that God would come and deliver him. And so David cried, even as a believer, that God would come and be in house of defense to him. You see, in such times, in in spite of David's power, his ability in warfare, his stature in terms of being king in the land, regardless of these things, he was a man who recognized the limitations of his ability. And so he turned to God frequently. He turned to God for help. And this is what salvation is. It is the cry of the dependent towards his sovereign. And this is what we long to see. Again, as governments run hither and thither trying to find the best solution, trying to come up with the best plan in order to stem more people being infected with this virus as they make continual appeals that people would stay in their homes if they can, as they try other methods, whether it be wearing masks or not wearing masks or or whatever, as various pieces of information disseminate from various governments there, there is certainly at times a, a, a real sense in which no one really knows what is the best approach. And as a preacher, it is certainly perhaps upon me more than others to think of how God is working in these times. The vanity of man as he tries to avoid the certainty of death. 
as we try to scramble to live out our days as long as possible, yet as we shall see sometime later, this, this life of ours is very brief. And if God appoints this virus to a man or any other form in which man will come to his demise in this life, he cannot escape it. But at the same time, we can do what we can, and even as we do what we can, we are to rest in the Lord. Moses was not a man who avoided his own sense of responsibility as he led the children of Israel. But there were limitations to his power, and he realized that thou hast been our dwelling place. God is the one we turn to. God is the defense of his people. And every person that enjoys God as their dwelling place comes to a point where they realize they have not all power in their own hands. Every person that comes to a sense in which they feel powerless lifts their eyes heavenward, I trust, and realizes that God is the only one who can deliver. Where does man hide from death? He may run, but he cannot hide. What is man's defense from death? There are none. And even more pertinently, pertinently, we may ask, what is man's refuge in face of damnation? And later we will see language that speaks of God's wrath. Verse 7, by thy wrath are we troubled. Verse 9, all our days are passed away in thy wrath. How are we going to run from that? Verse 11, who knoweth the power of thine anger? Do we know? Where do we hide? And how do we get there? So how do you obtain God as your dwelling place? How do we get to the point that Moses found himself in and those that he was well aware had turned to the Lord in previous generations? It is through his Son, Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only refuge for sinners. There are no substitutes. There is no equivalent. Jesus Christ is the exclusive answer for men. And he said that very plainly in John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he said also in John chapter 6, verse 56, that those who partake of him, quote, dwelleth in me and I in him. Those who partake of Christ dwell in in him. And that's the language, is it not? Thou hast been our dwelling place. Jesus said, you partake of me, you will dwell in me. He is God made flesh. And as we turn to, to our God, as we seek for refuge in God, it is to Christ specifically that we run. We run to the Son of God. We run to God's answer for sinners. The New Testament is replete with references that signify that the place where man needs to be is, quote-unquote, in Christ. It is language of union, language of fellowship. It resembles a sense of a, a dwelling place. Are not our dwelling places places of fellowship, places of unity? They ought to be. And we wish it and desire it for our homes, for our families, that our dwelling places are places of peace and fellowship. And this is what the sinner has when he flees to Christ. He flees into Christ and he finds a place of fellowship. Fellowship with the Father through the Son. Fellowship with God in a way he had never known before. And so men come to enjoy what Moses speaks of here by running to Jesus Christ. You may say, if you're well aware, that this precedes the arrival of our Lord Jesus Christ. Moses did not know the Lord Jesus Christ in the way that we know of him looking back on history. But all that Moses instituted, all that God gave to him, when God appointed the Passover at the time of deliverance from Egypt, it was pointing to this one, even Jesus Christ, who is our Passover. When God took Moses up into the mount and showed him the pattern of the tabernacle and that he was to fashion it after that way, all of the furniture and everything that was depicted was pointing to Christ. 
and all the sacrifices that he would institute and, and give to Aaron, to his sons, to, to, to carry out in their labors as the, as the priests of the people. It was all pointing to our Lord Jesus Christ, to his person and to his work. And so there's a very real sense, even though the time of Moses preceded the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ, that what they were trusting in, what they were looking to, was precisely the same. Thou hast been our dwelling place. We turn to Christ. In the same passage of John 6, where we've quoted already, in verse 37, Jesus invites sinners that him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. To dwell in Christ is to have gone to Christ. So I ask you the question, have you gone to Christ? Have you turned to Christ? Have your feet by faith fled from sin and from the wrath of God? And have you gone to Christ as the only refuge appointed by the Father? This is how men, from a human perspective, come to be dwelling with God. It happens because we go to Christ. We run to Him. We run to Him with our sin. We don't want it upon our own heads. We realize that our sin must be punished, that a just and holy God must deal with sin. He cannot overlook it any more than a judge, if he does his job, will overlook crimes. God must deal with sin. And what we do as sinners, we run to Jesus Christ, where upon the cross we see God dealing with our sin in His Son. We see the one who bore our sins upon his own body. We see the one who bears away the wrath of God for those that trust in him. And we are set free from fear of condemnation. So I ask you again, have you taken your sin to the cross? And by faith have you come to understand that through the cross alone, God is reconciling sinners to himself? I turn your eyes today away from the media, and the noise. And I turn you to God in Christ. And I turn you to Him that He may be your dwelling place. From a human perspective, this is how it works. You go to Christ, and those who go to Christ will be saved by Christ. This is the human perspective of how, of how we come to dwell in our God. But let's think also of the divine perspective. How is it that God has become our dwelling place from the heavenly perspective, from God's perspective? It is because God appointed it to be so. Now here's the humbling thing, very humbling indeed. It is to realize that those who have come to dwell in God have done so by His invitation and His appointment. It is all really sourced in him and his activity more than in man's activity. We read in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he, this is God the Father, he hath chosen us in him, that is in Christ, when has He chosen us in Christ? It tells us, before the foundation of the world. God appointed us to find our dwelling place in His Son before the foundation of the world. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You see here how the Apostle Paul sets Christ aside as, as the wisdom of God, as the righteousness of God, as the means of sanctification and redemption. But see how it begins in the verse, But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus. That is, by God's 
agency and power we are brought to be in Christ Jesus. Very easy to overlook that in that text. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus by God's sovereign will and activity. You're come to be in Christ. You did not force yourself into God, believer. God appointed you to dwell in Christ from eternity past. And then he brought you in time and he rejoices in your company with him through Christ. You have not knocked on a door that God was unwilling to open. You have not brought yourself into a dwelling place, into a house of defense without invitation or without the first activity being on God's part. God being the defense and being the house of defense has first moved to a point that you come and assemble with him and his son and this is what Moses reflects upon. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place. Thou hast been our dwelling place. So we have answered the question, how has God become our dwelling place? We have seen it from the human perspective. We see it also from the divine perspective. And we marvel at what we have. And those of you perhaps still outside of Christ, I trust you will come to marvel too, that you will again see that it is in a simple childlike faith you take God at his word, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And there is no need to question his promise and assurance of salvation. Secondly then, we ask, why must God be our dwelling place? Why? Why must God be our dwelling place? Why do we turn there as our dwelling place? Well, again, a couple of ways in which we may look at this. First, because of a lack of a home in the world. Because of a lack of a home in the world. I think it may be true to say that Moses never really had a home. When he found himself in the palace of Egypt, in the courts of Egypt, he was not where his family was. He did not grow up in the home of his parents, growing up with his sister Miriam and his brother Aaron. He was at a distance from them. Whenever he was in the desert of Midian, again, he was not just away from family, but away from the Hebrew people. And when he was finally close to his siblings, Miriam and Aaron, and his kinsmen, he was in the wilderness with the prospect that Canaan would be his home. But he never made it there. He never got there. And so in one sense, we may say that, that Moses never really had a home. Not, a real, not in a real and true sense of it, but it did not cause him any concern, really, because of what he says in the text. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place. Thou hast been. And he could personalize it. Thou hast been my dwelling place. And wherever he found himself, whether as a young man realizing his circumstances in the Egyptian court, or whether in the deserts of Midian, or whether in the wilderness, he had a home in his God, a resting place there for his soul. And so in this way, Moses was much like his ancestors. Even though the patriarchs dwelt in the land of promise, it was not theirs. And Canaan was really just a type and foreshadowing of what was to come for them. Turn for a moment to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. In this well-known chapter, our minds are drawn to consider the experience of those who had gone before Moses, as well as those that came after him, at least in a number of them highlighted for us. But in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, we read of Abraham, by faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, not as his home, it was as a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him, of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker 
is God. This is a fascinating look at the life of Abraham, an insight into his perspective as he lived. It is so easy to simply reduce all of Abraham's experience to that which related to the material and physical land and the promise of that land. But the writer to the Hebrews realizes that it went much further than that. For Abraham, his hope was settled somewhere far beyond this world. John Calvin notes on Hebrews 11 verse 10, "'This was indeed to see things invisible. It was no doubt a great thing to cherish in their hearts the assurance given them by God respecting the possession of the land until it was after some ages realized. Yet, as they did not confine their thoughts, no, not to that land, but penetrated even into heaven.'" Abraham, along with Isaac and with Jacob, they by faith had their gaze set upon something, set upon a world that was far beyond this present wicked material world. And we must live in this world just as they. But by faith they looked beyond. They looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. A world not fashioned by the hands of men, And this is the life of faith. We follow in the footsteps of the father of the faithful, Abraham, and we, like him, are to live in the same fashion. This world is not our final destination. And so God must be our dwelling place because we lack a home in this world. We don't really have a home here, beloved. This world is not your home. Certainly you may have lived in Greenville or wherever you are this day for many, many, many years. And for some of you, perhaps you have traveled around a little like myself and you've called many different places home for a period of time. But ultimately, regardless of, of which category you fall into, this world is not our home. It has been a marvel for me to watch how quickly this world has been brought to its knees. Massive corporations who've known nothing but tremendous growth in the past decade have been crippled in a matter of days. The entire restaurant, hospitality, and travel industries are hanging on by their fingernails. The nosedive and interest rates have hit the banks hard, and and they know their profits are going to be cut greatly in coming days. Just recently, the U.S. became a net exporter of oil, and and that has crashed as well, having a huge impact in the overall economy. And men are scrambling. (laughs) They don't know what to do. They don't know what is on the horizon. How long will the recovery period be after all is said and done? No man knows. And there have to be those, perhaps beyond our circle of friendship, Uh, but they are dealing with huge corporations, massive businesses, and they really are scrambling. It's not just about them, but it's about all the employees, the tens of thousands that are employed by them, or even in some cases in the airline industry, the, the hundreds of thousands that are employed by them directly, never mind indirectly. And they're all scrambling. Man, man may call this world his home, but it is a hostile place if it is. It's not here to nurture and take care of you. It is a world of thorns and thistles, a world of briars and hardship, a world wherein we can barely get along and get by by the sweat of our brow. It can quickly come caving in around us. And I say to you, dear Christian, Let the fragility and uncertainty of these things direct your eyes to that city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now is a time where we may more easily meditate upon the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 6, verse 19 and following. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, 
and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We are to live wisely. The Lord does not call us to folly. And certainly, as we may put it, we ought to make hay while the sun shines. So many have been doing over the last decade of advancement in the economy. But it is so easy to get our eyes off what is important. And certainly, as things teeter, and as we wonder what is on the morrow and what way this will impact our lives in the future, it certainly is a bringing back to earth. For every child of God who may have gotten their eyes off where our true home is. Don't lay up treasures here expecting them to satisfy or to guarantee your future. We lay up treasures in heaven. We labor for Christ, realizing that in all of our shuffling away of, of material things, uh, trying to plan for the future as best we can, in all of this, our only certainty is Christ. And so, with Moses, we are brought to our knees to acknowledge again that God is our dwelling place. God, that will be the case not only in this life, but in the life to come. We are to turn to the Lord as our dwelling place. This world is not our final home. The Apostle Paul, writing, and certainly in the, the face of possible death for him as he was in, in bonds in Rome at the time. He writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Our conversation is in heaven. Our citizenship, it may be translated, is in heaven. That is where we ultimately belong. We are of a kingdom that is not of this world. And while we live in it, and we are not to hide away from it, and it is God's purpose for us to shine as lights in this world and to be the salt of of this world, at the same time, it is not our final home. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, the Apostle Paul, delineating the difference that the gospel makes for those that come to Christ, especially for the Gentile, he says to them, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And what the apostle has in mind there, no doubt, is that the Gentiles have been brought in to have the citizenship that the patriarchs and the Hebrews knew and all those who trusted in their God in Israel. That same sense of having a home beyond this world, Gentiles have come to enjoy as well. We have joined with Moses, certainly even taking Ephesians 2.19 into our minds and understanding it in light of our text this morning in Psalm 90 verse 1, as Moses says, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. And so we can enter into that and we can say, yes, it's true. It's not just true for Moses to say in his day, or for him to highlight the fact that God had been the dwelling place of those who had preceded him. But we can say it today with the same confidence and assurance, Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place. We have turned to Thee, our God. We trust in Thee, our God. And so, why must God be our dwelling place? Because of a lack of home in the world. We don't really have a home here. Whatever we have here is, is just temporary. It will pass. We have a home in our God who will one day bring us to be with Himself more fully than we even know today. But also because of the great hostility of the world. Why? Why must God be our dwelling place? Because of the great hostility of the world. If one refuses to make God their dwelling place, then, of course, the world will accept them. The world will take them in. You reject Christ, the world will accept you. They will have you as their own. But let me ask the question, at what cost will you have the world show friendship to you? At what cost? 
Can the world pay the debt of your sins? Those sins that are brought to light in verse 8 of this psalm, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. What can the world do with sin? What can the world offer for sinners? How can the world help you escape the wrath of God? Again, the wrath we've mentioned already that is mentioned in this psalm. What can the world offer in light of verses 7 through 11? The fact that we are consumed by God's anger and in thy wrath are we troubled and, troubled and so on. What can the world offer? It has nothing. It has nothing. And so we must make Christ our refuge. We must run to the Lord and say, Thou hast been our dwelling place. But in so doing, of course, the world turns against us. Inevitably. In John chapter 7, verse 7, speaking to the unbelieving, the Lord Jesus said, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. And I am only too well aware of that when opportunities are given to me to speak, especially to those to whom I may be unfamiliar and those to whom the gospel may be unfamiliar, at least when it is spoken with tremendous directness and plainness, often I can see the hostility in their faces. I can see their animosity. But this is how the world responds to the truth. The world cannot hate the unbeliever, but it hates Christ because Christ testifies of it that the works thereof are evil. And no one wants to consider the fact that we do deserve this that is happening to us and much more. We do. Oh, beloved, don't, don't paper over it. Don't veneer it. We do deserve this and much more. We are ripe for judgment. It is a marvel that we have gone on so long without even more happening to us. But nonetheless, as we said earlier in our prayer, in wrath, remember mercy. We cast ourselves on the mercy of God. You can see that even Moses would do the same. In verse 14 of our psalm, O satisfy us early with thy mercy. We throw ourselves upon thy mercy. May we enjoy the sense of mercy. May we come to enjoy that knowledge that God has been merciful to us. I trust that that will be the case amidst even our circumstance at present. We must run to God because the world is hostile against us. And to make this very, very plain, I turn you to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. <clears throat> As our Lord Jesus prepares His disciples to minister in His absence, He turns their attention to language that will prepare them. John 15 Verse 18, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. They have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. But, that, but he that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my Father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. The world hates Christ and subsequently hates the followers of Jesus Christ. They hate those who will identify with Christ rather than with the enemies. Of Christ. 
And because we identify with our Lord Jesus, they will turn against us. The servant is not greater than his Lord. Because they persecuted him, they will persecute you. And because the world rejects the man, the message, and the miracles of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you can see that in verses 21 through 24, and because we affirm all these things, we experience the hostility of the world. As we close, I underscore again that this world has no comfort to offer. And what comfort it proposes to offer and seeks to present before men can never bring any real lasting comfort at all. Just speak to the thousands across the world that are experiencing what is going on in a very personal way. The scenes in Italy are utterly tragic. The news is telling us of, of the fact that so many are in the hospitals, they, they have no room for them. And they have, the morgue is, is filled and they have, they just lined up coffin after coffin ready to be cremated. And the families, the families can't even come together, such as the quarantining. They can't even come and mourn the loss of their loved ones. It's very unusual and heartbreaking days. And who knows to what extent it will come here. Just five in this state so far, but there may be more. What do we do? What do we do as we face the threat upon our health, the threat upon the economy? We say, Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place. Thou hast been our dwelling place. Lead the way, child of God, in your confidence. Speak with that cheer that reflects not a sense of triteness about what is going on in the world, but an awareness that there is something more than this world can ever offer. God is your dwelling place. Resort to Him frequently. Depend upon Him entirely. And trust His Word every single day. And again, I urge upon the families of our congregation particularly, and any other families that may be watching on, if you are affected to the point that you are being shut in, please let this be a time that, that revives a practice of family worship in your home. When so often we are busy, this may be God's way, at least in part, of slowing us down and helping us to learn what so often was commonplace upon these shores, a people who pray together in their homes, a people, though they may not have had much of the world and what it has to offer, a people who made God their dwelling place. And that was manifest in every home where the Bible was read and prayer was offered. May the Lord guide us and help us and may He be merciful to us and may He speak to those who are yet outside of Christ. May you come and make Christ your dwelling place even today. And if we can help you in any way, please do not hesitate to contact us and we'll be glad to help as we are able. May God bless his word. Let's still our hearts before him. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank thee for thy word. It is always relevant. It is always appropriate. We pray that thou wilt bless our meditation in this passage this morning. We ask that it might be even more relevant than the preacher ever imagined it to be. May it be a means of meditation for all the people of God who have heard it. And may it be a help to everyone who may be concerned at this time. But grant, Lord, that thy people, who ought to be the most confident people upon the earth, may we know the comfort of thy word and live in the comfort of thy word. And may we enjoy the sweet sense of thy presence in our homes or wherever we find ourselves. So again, continue to bless us as we 
look to the Word of God in this fashion. And may it not be uh, a time that is wasted. May it please thee, O God, help us to redeem the time, for the days are indeed evil. May we be given grace and help and the unfilling of the Spirit of God that we may be used in ways we never thought or imagined. Hear these prayers and bless all in their homes who have heard today, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.